Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. Welcome to the final session of the day. Uh, my name's Owen Wheatley. I'm the lead partner at ISG for Banking and Financial Services. And today I'm going to be taking you through a very interesting topic, very timely, which is the crucial role of service providers within the banking ecosystem. Uh, today's agenda then is split into the parts that you can see on the screen. Firstly, we're going to take a quick scoot through the impact of COVID-19 on financial services firms. Then we're going to talk about what that means for their priorities and imperatives. Uh, then we're going to talk about the main topic today, which is how and why financial institutions are embracing ecosystems, specifically what are the benefits of such an ecosystem, what kind of players are involved in ecosystems, and what are the prevalent models that we see in the industry today. And then we'll conclude with a summary and some key takeaways. So let's dive straight in. The, the, follow, the first slide that I wanted to take you through is some of the common themes that we see. Of course, every financial institution was affected and is being affected slightly differently by COVID-19, but there are some common themes. And so I'm gonna take you through some of those on, on these first two slides. Initially, when this first hit, of course, many financial institutions were forced to spend to ensure business continuity. And fundamentally, this was about a secure remote working environment for employees at scale, something that was unprecedented uh, before February, March, April of this year. What that meant was, in real terms, trying to enable their employees via collaboration tools with secure technology from locations all around the world. And not everybody was able to cope with that. Uh, a large bank that we worked with, for example, was forced to onshore a load of work because its offshore delivery center didn't have the capability to do just that. This also meant uh, that there was an increased focus on third party providers. So where a provider had uh, was performing services for clients offshore, then it was about trying to engage flexibly, provide that operational resilience, business continuity and risk management. Not, all, not always possible. And many providers that we saw uh, were asking for SLA uh, relief because they weren't able to hit their continuity service levels. Thirdly, we saw the huge federal stimulus in the US and around the world, in the US uh, as part of the CARES Act, PPP loans, et cetera. Many of the banks were forced at very short notice to adopt much more efficient lending processes that required immediate investment, both from a people, process, and technology perspective. Uh, and then finally, what we've seen is much higher provisions for future loan losses and payment holidays that were forced to be granted. Uh, both on the consumer and the commercial side. So those banks that are exposed to high risk sectors such as leisure and hospitality um, have seen their provisions for future losses increase by four or 500% year over year uh, in Q2 and Q3 of this year. What we see on the next slide is the continuation of this COVID wrecking ball. Uh, from the perspective of income, many of the financial institutions rely on interest rates uh, as their main source of income, particularly on the retail banking side, with those at almost zero and the much reduced consumer spending uh, and the resultant drop in interchange and network fees, those are huge impacts on revenue and margins. And in fact, when it comes to cross-border payments, uh, those were down even more than everything else. And they are one of the most profitable sources of revenue that we see uh, for, for financial institutions, huge impacts. Secondly, uh, we are actually seeing now that uh, whereas a lot of transformation uh, opportunities were paused in Q2, there's a realization that you can't keep that pause button uh, pressed down forever. This is something that we're gonna have to live with for longer than we want to. And so we are seeing a return of tech investment, particularly on acceleration in cloud migration, digital engagement, which we'll pick up later, and intelligent automation. This idea of customer engagement via digital channels has been somewhat forced on us by the fact that we can't actually attend a bank branch, for example, but it was just accelerating a trend that was already happening. Um, and the keys here that we're seeing are around data insight, self-service and contact center transformation. We'll talk about this subject a little bit more uh, on the subsequent slides. And then finally, the obvious thing to say, but the forced focus on real estate, uh, this covered financial institutions of all uh, creeds and colors. Um, you know, this is not a temporary shift. The idea that branches, uh, nobody's able to visit them anymore. And when they are able to visit them again, they'll probably want to do different things at the branch. Um, and from a corporate HQ perspective, 
what roles actually need to be co-located within a 5,000, 10,000 person building in a central business district, whereas what can be done remotely. So on the next slide, what we're going to talk about is something that happened before COVID-19. We're all fixated on COVID-19 and the impacts that we've just gone through. But it's certainly true to say that even before the pandemic, this is an industry that was undergoing unprecedented change and disruption. Never better highlighted than this example on the slide. Zions Bank, 125 years old, well-respected, great reputation, 10,000 employees, $3 billion a year of revenue, healthy profit margins, and a market valuation, when I put this slide together last week, of 5.3 billion, it's around 5.4 billion this morning. You compare that with Revolut, one of the startup banks that's only established five years ago, low number of employees, very low revenue in relative terms, and actually their annual loss tripled this year to $140 million. And yet, based on their last funding round in February of this year, valued at $5.5 billion. This is the premium that investors are placing on customer experience and leveraging smart technology. It's a stark example, a stark reminder that even taking COVID to one side, this was an industry undergoing massive change. What we're going to see on the next slide is the priorities and imperatives, therefore, that we see in this industry. And I'll skip through these before we get into the ecosystem piece. Firstly, from the perspective of retail banks, this continued focus on customer experience to drive intimacy, loyalty and wallet share is absolutely everything. There was a recent survey I noted that showed that 73% of customers expect the personalized special treatment and service and rewards for their loyalty from their banks, but only 22% said they were receiving it. And that really says it all. The banks are not doing a good job from a CX perspective. Further investment in digital channels, contact center of the future. This is one of the hottest topics that we at ISG see with our clients today. The ways about enabling agents in uh, uh, co uh, contact centers to be more productive, to operate on an end-to-end -end process basis, to drive revenue, not just field queries and complaints. Why is that important? Well, because since 2008-9, many retail banks around the world have flatlined in terms of revenues. Um, this is something that was a problem even before COVID hit that top line, and it's even more of a problem today. They also face exploding costs for some of the reasons that we've just mentioned, and expense items, including provisions for future losses, are just going to exacerbate that problem. The battle for talent applies to retail banks, as it does to most of the other financial institutions, how to enable employees, attract the right people with the right skills, and make sure they have a great experience to retain them. We've talked about competition. And of course, it goes without saying that regulatory pressure and the spectre of fines is ever present. And in fact, um, long gone are the days of global coordination on regulations and the multi-jurisdictional divergence that we see, I would expect to continue, um, particularly in Europe. From an asset management perspective, again, historically low interest rates, not helpful. Uh, unprecedented margin pressure was already affecting these guys. Uh, in many cases, they have lots of legacy technology. And again, they are in the same position of fighting off new competition from customer centric entrants who have this slick user experience, lower fees or different types of commercial models, such as Robinhood, which was recently valued at more than $11 billion, uh, even though their average customer age is just 31. Um, so the other alternative that these guys have is, do we go robo advisory? Do we not? Who are we targeting? Is it the mass affluent sector or otherwise? How do we leverage that technology? These are problems that the guys are all wrestling with. And from the, from the perspective of large establishments like these, the main risk is disintermediation of primary contact and preference data. This is why we see so many upgrades to CX amongst all of these type of firms. On the next slide, what we can see is the impact on investment banks and insurers. Now, investment banks, it's certainly true to say, have a much more diversified income stream and therefore are not so reliant on interest rates as their sources of income. And therefore, they've been slightly more insulated uh, than retail banks from that perspective. However, they have a long list of challenges themselves, uh, including new ways of working. That applies to them as it, much, as, as it does to everybody else who can work remotely. Can you really effectively trade remotely, non-co-located? Can you get the right tech to people with the right security in a remote model? That's a very difficult question to answer. Movement to client-centric business models away from simply looking at products and trying to, to really drive insight and advice and monetize that insight and advice in different ways through performance-related fees. 
this is one of the reasons why we see some of the biggest firms partnering with new fintech platforms uh, such as JP Morgan leveraging WeMatch for securities and Goldman Sachs uh, working with Nutmeg for digital wealth management. Those are a couple of examples that we'll come back to later on. Re re regulatory compliance, we mentioned earlier, they still have the issue about bearing down on costs and they're really focused on simplifying processes. And I don't just mean through automation, but actually process elimination um, and uh, platformization, I guess you could call it, with end-to-end -end platforms, uh, eating operations and technology. Central business district, real estate, same issue, huge locations in very expensive uh, parts of cities like New York and London around the world. What can they do with those? Who's gonna need to work there? What can we do with them? We've just signed a hundred year lease, but what, what can we do to get out of that? How can we help monetize it? And then finally, big data analytics and intelligent automation, even before the pandemic, investment banks were focused very much on trying to find use cases to leverage those, um, whether that be internal facing in the middle and back office or um, customer facing in the front office. And finally, from an insurance perspective, again, customer experience is king, omni-channel access in particular here and reduced journey friction. And when you think about the engine room of insurers, claims and underwriting, these are under, undergoing significant transformation, both in terms of automation from, for example, uh, risk assessments and uh, increasing claims predictability, uh, but also leveraging data for customer insights. Uh, most of the firms that I've been talking about today have huge amounts of data, but much of it is not aggregated. It's not a single view of a customer, and it makes the customer journey very, very clunky. Again, we have fierce competition from the likes of Lemonade and Hippo and others and that threat of disintermediation. And we see a whole uh, suite of new models, insure as you go. Um, this, is a, this is a classic one with things like covers insurance for uh, insure as you drive. But who owns the data in these models? And do you have the right kind of cover for what you need? In fact, there was a, a lovely quote in a recent study uh, which put it when it was referring to customers thinking about their insurance policies, do I have the cover I need and do I need the cover I have? So given that these are the priorities and imperatives, we've taken a quick look at the impact of COVID on some of these firms. I guess what we need to think about now is what are the ways that financial institutions are addressing these priorities? And we can see that on the next slide. I've grouped these into three. Firstly, reimagining ways of working, and that in involves people, collaboration, and technology. Secondly, enabling their employees to be happier and more productive. This has been huge in the last six months. Focusing on productivity, making sure that these people are uh, effective in what they do, but also that they're happy from a, <clears throat> a client retention and a customer retention perspective, not just the employees themselves. And finally, embracing ecosystems and partnerships. This is what we're going to focus on for the rest of the session, and I'll take you through that in a bit more detail on this next slide. So what are the benefits of an ecosystem approach? What we're going to be thinking about here is how will an ecosystem help to address some of the problems, the priorities and imperatives we've just talked about? And really, I think about this in five different categories. And if we start from the bottom left, I'll take you through a, a few of these in some more detail. So firstly, building an ecosystem to help with revenue, specifically to help with income stream diversification. And that might be done through new products, that might be done through new channels to market, or it could be done through some combination of, the, of those two things. A couple of examples here, we've mentioned one of them already, and that's Goldman Sachs working with Nutmeg uh, to focus on wealth management for younger investors who weren't attracted by Goldman Sachs standard offerings uh, that, they, that they provide to the market. Secondly, HSBC partnered with Netfin, for rapid commercial lending for mid-market firms where they weren't strong. So again, that's a good example of a new channel to market and new custom segments that they weren't able to reach themselves. Secondly, if we think about compliance, always a huge topic for financial institutions and the impact of COVID-19, as we said earlier, on offshore delivery centers and business continuity meant this became even more uh, important. The ability to react quickly and securely within the regulations and stay compliant, absolutely paramount given the level of fees and fines that we see levied by regulators around the world. The acceleration in cloud migration that we've also talked about, digital engagement, both of these massively increase the risk of cybersecurity issues. And so we see partnerships like Citibank and Feedsi for real-time risk management. And last week, in fact, we saw MasterCard announce that it will offer a new 
AI-based cyber tool to banks via the acquisition of Risk Recon that it did recently. That's an example of a proactive partnership coming together to service other financial institutions. When we think about customer experience, <clears throat> this is one of the most important things for any financial institution where the ability to leverage data and AI to drive insight and crucially to monetize that insight is absolutely everything. This is about transforming that front end experience, reducing friction on customer journeys, getting closer to your customer. And we hear the term mass personalization all the time. That is the ultimate goal. A good example here is Westpac partnering with Microsoft's data driven experience platform DDEP for real time personalized services. Fourthly, we look at talent. We've already said how there's a talent shortage and the battle for talent is fierce. So expanding the talent pool via an ecosystem has obvious benefits. But firstly, even before you think about an ecosystem, trying to turn everything into a service, uh, everything as a service and automation to reduce reliance on individuals becomes ever more important. But fast, scalable access to top talent is vital if you're going to differentiate yourself from the competition. The other thing to mention here is the growing impact of what you might call the gig economy or the open economy, open talent, crowdsourcing, whatever you, might, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and the likes of Topcoder and the partnership that they have with Wipro is a good example of leveraging the ability of individuals uh, for the benefit of your ecosystem partners. And finally, from a technology perspective, we know that many large established financial institutions are struggling with a big spaghetti of legacy systems and platforms um, that don't talk to each other, very expensive, but they are the heart and lungs of the organization. It's very, very difficult to rip that out and replace it. And so the fastest way of acquiring new capability is to look to partner. And so we see this emerging model of parallel running of different platforms to mitigate risk, cost and time to replace. Uh, and some of the examples that I've given already today are the acquisition of or the partnering with uh, a new platform, either for new customers um, or for new products. Of course, this does bring issues of integration and data management, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So on the next slide, what we're going to talk about is what type of firms constitute an ecosystem. And really, you can group them into any number of categories. I've just provided five on the page here, uh, plus incumbents, which I've slightly separated because they have a slightly different perspective on what that ecosystem uh, is or should be. And if we just take a few highlights from some of these uh, individuals, so fintech firms, <clears throat> we all think about fintechs when we think about partnerships and ecosystems today. These are digital natives, nimble operators. Often they have uh, venture capital backing and uh, innovative products and so on, very much focused on smart technology and customer experience and or security. Those tend to be the largest two areas in what fintechs are doing today. We've already discussed a few examples of these and there'll be more to follow. On the other side, RegTech, this is actually the fastest growing area of new entrants that we see with that focus on cybersecurity and risk. And we're seeing the emergence of many, many compliance as a service models, not only from what you would call RegTech startups or scale-ups, but from many of the established players in the market too, because the advantage of everything as a service uh, is obvious to the large established banks. Then if we think about service providers, what you might call a traditional service provider, long tradition of highly skilled people delivering services over many years, centers of excellence and labs, end-to-end -end solutions, and they are increasingly bringing their own ecosystem. That's something that's very important. And we'll finish with that later when we talk about some key takeaways. And finally, just to talk about tech providers, uh, sometimes these guys are large and have um, an industry agnostic client base. But often, if you think about players like FIS or Broadridge, specifically playing in the financial services industry, they have a platform or X as a service first approach. And often they come with creative service models and, and different types of commercials and pricing options. Finally, uh, I work for ISG, so it wouldn't be right for me to finish this slide without mentioning advisors. We do form a key part of many ecosystems with our clients today. Uh, we do bring industry insight and domain expertise, and we're increasingly used uh, for strategy and design work. That is to help our clients understand how do we get from A to B? What does B even look like? What is possible out there, especially in these times of uncertainty? Our role as the market giving a perspective is increasingly useful when trying to put these kind of ecosystems together. Now I want to 
shift gears a little bit and talk on the next slide about the four different types of partnership models that we see in the industry today. And of course, you know, it's important to say that there is a good degree of overlap between some of these models. Uh, so the, some of the lines are blurred, both in terms of the characteristics we're going to go through and also some of the examples. But fundamentally, the way I see this market, there are four different ways to work together in an ecosystem. One is simple collaboration. One is a JV or utility based model. One is co-innovation and one is acquisition and or investment. Now, we're going to take a look at each one in turn. So on the first slide, we're going to look at collaboration. Characteristics and approach for collaboration. This really is the most common engagement model that we see in the industry today. And the typical starting point for a bank in this situation would be to start by identifying gaps or if you like their vulnerability to disruption in their existing operating model. This is something that ISG actually helps clients with to look over and work out, okay, where are we failing? Where are the customer journeys? Um, where are the heat spots on those customer journeys? And uh, where are the gaps in, our, in the service and the products that we're providing? The, the landscape is then researched uh, along with advisory support typically to find a potential partner. And what is that right solution to help, help fill that gap? Good examples here. There's quite a few on this uh, on this slide. There's many that we could all think about. But um, if you look at something like Lloyd's Bank and Vault for retail banking, that's a cl classic example. Uh, Metro Bank and Wipro for some of the testing transformation work that's been done. We mentioned JP Morgan and WeMatch earlier. And an interesting one is NatWest and Soldo for white labeled SME lending. This is actually uh, Soldo white, lab white labeling NatWest products, not the other way around. Uh, and HSBC and Roostify for digital home lending, which uh, of course has been ripe for transformation for many years. On the next slide, we're going to look at joint ventures and utility models. Now, it's true to say that establishing these kind of JVs and utility models is not prevalent in the industry. There are, there are examples, and we can see some of them on this slide that we'll talk about. But this is a more formal and strategic partnership, and it is, it is relatively rare uh, because of the need to clearly define those respective strengths and responsibilities, but also this idea about being somewhat non-differentiating to avoid commercial and proprietary concerns. Many times when a bank enters a, an ecosystem partnership with someone with a view to then reselling that service elsewhere, um, unless the services are deemed to be somewhat commodity in things like, for example, reference data, uh, it's very hard to get other banks to, uh, to, to join that ecosystem or to pay for that utility. There are examples, though. I list a few of them here, like Infosys's reconciliation platform, uh, Cognizant data management for regulatory reporting, and an interesting one, actually, uh, Treza, which was acquired by uh, Societe Generale. This is banking as a service, and they actually provide services to more than 70 other banks. Um, but SocGen actually accelerates those rollouts as part of that and is responsible for regulatory compliance in Know Your Customer and AML, et cetera. So that's an example where th there is a bank involved with a startup or scale up to provide services to other banks. That's quite rare though uh, in the industry in relative terms. On the next slide, uh, we look at co-innovation. And this is really where banks are setting up their own hubs and sandboxes and R&D labs and innovation labs. Um, service providers also do their own and we have some of those examples here with Westpac's Innovation Hub in Singapore. Um, we have uh, the most common perhaps consortium approach is always around blockchain. And there's an example here, R3 plus uh, 12 of their partner banks trying to identify the best use cases for distributed leg ledger technology. Um, these partnerships might include investment as well from the bank, as well as just kind of support and guidance from an infrastructure perspective that very much varies. Um, but we see many service providers doing this, for example, Atos's FinHub, DXC and Stone and & Chalk and Mindtree's Digital Pumpkin Hub. And then the final slide on this, acquisition and investment. And really this is where uh, the bank is looking to invest in or acquire fintechs to enter new markets acquire new customers, access new products and talent, especially talent in some cases. Um, the focus really is on startups and scale ups and it's about placing bets on what looks like something that is going to be long term sustainable and profitable. And the aim is really to move the needle by securing permanent access to those capabilities rather than a simple collaboration or partnership model. 
There are some good examples. Goldman Sachs is actually the hungriest bank uh, in the market. If you look at number of acquisitions made in the last two years, a couple of examples here, Bond Street and Clarity Money. Uh, UBS Next is their branded investment arm, and they've invested $200 million already in startups. Barclays uh, is also very active in this space and has invested in Sten and Caron for Global Risk Analytics. Of course, there are many challenges in this model, finding the right partner to, to, uh, to acquire or invest in, what is the valuation given that they are typically non-profit making, retaining the talent because there may actually be a lack of cultural fit. Some of these people that are acquired through this mechanism really want to just kind of exist in a startup mode. Uh, they want to be um, really innovative and they may be constrained by the, um, the bureaucracy and hierarchy of a, of a large established bank. Integrating these acquisitions with existing systems is a real headache for CTOs and CIOs. Uh, and then how do you actually measure the success of that acquisition in terms of incremental ROI? So there are many challenges to this model. And so if I could finish off by summarizing on the next slide, where we were and where we are. From a conventional model perspective, as I've called it, the focus was always very much on product and distribution from a banking perspective, whereas now the focus has quite clearly shifted to being around customer centricity. In terms of the role of technology, that was always traditionally to reduce cost and improve, improve efficiency. And whilst I'm not saying that those things are no longer important, it's clear to me in talking to a lot of banks that actually now they're looking for technology to create this multifaceted outward looking organization. And that plays out in the attitude, which used to be very much about insular, looking inward at the bank, proprietary technology, proprietary methods and processes, very much now around teaming and collaboration. But of course, there have always been and always will be challenges. And whereas those used to be around legacy systems and siloed products, poor customer experience, now it's very much challenging that mindset of the banks have always thought, you know, build first. They're trying to get away from that. That remains a challenge. And picking the right partners, as we've said, is always difficult. And so I'm going to finish with two slides on key takeaways. And to begin with, you know, my advice would be to everybody on this call, approaching banks to form part of an ecosystem, uh, bring domain expertise. Sounds obvious. It's ever more important. Um, if you bring generic offerings, generic skills, generic technology, it's not going to wash. Domain expertise is key. And make sure that you tie your proposals to business imperatives. We've spoken about what some of those are by financial institution. Make sure that it addresses something you know is of important to them. And don't just assume that they can see that link. Actually make it explicit. Do come with needle mover ideas. The banks are really looking for these kind of leapfrog transformation initiatives. Don't be afraid to go big. And do think about build, operate, transfer, because this is a good way to, uh, to, to address the battle for talent by providing your services, but on a perhaps time-limited basis with the knowledge transfer back in-house at the end of perhaps one, three, or five years, according to what the services are. And on the final slide, do propose innovative pricing and gain share models this is very, very important. You need to show that you have skin in the game as part of an ecosystem. It's expected, your partners, you're trying to drive for the same goals. Make sure the commercial models reflect that. Do provide access to your best talent in R&D because even though uh, banks understand that providers have tons and tons of capability, labs, great people, one of the biggest complaints that I hear is that they don't feel able to get access to it. So make that available. Be clear on which kind of collaboration model is going to be of most value to you and to the bank in question. Do think through those different types that we've talked about today. And do partner with other providers proactively. I can't stress enough that the banks that I talk to absolutely love it when a provider comes forward with, with a, a, an ecosystem already in place with partners to provide best of breed for different types of solution. Don't wait for the bank itself to put you into an ecosystem. Bring your own. And so the final, uh, the final slide today is uh, that many of the, the themes that I've explored today are available uh, in our ISG Momentum ecosystem banking report. So please do look to download that for additional details. And at that point, I will hand it back to the moderator and see if there are any questions in the last few minutes that we have. Hey, Owen, Paul Gatzigan here. Thank you very much for that. Who better to hear from than you? Great advice for the providers. We're up against it on time. Yep. So I'm going to squeeze in one question. Uh, you talked a lot about fintech and regtech, startups and scale-ups. 
how has the pandemic changed their access to funding and also changed their business models? Well, uh, if it's going to be one, make it a difficult one, eh, Paul? Um, yeah, so. thank you for that. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great question. So I would say that uh, in terms of the, the way that the pandemic has affected investment in startups and scale-ups, I'd say that um, in some cases it has badly affected it in the sense that we see, uh, we see volumes down. Uh, we see VC firms uh, looking for plans to profitability. I think in the past they've been prepared to overlook the fact that a lot of these startups don't make any money. Um, but now they're actually saying, you've got to show me that path to profitability if I'm going to invest in you. And we see in the likes of Monzo Bank, um, hugely reduced valuations because uh, the spending rounds just aren't uh, as plentiful as they used to be. But in terms of business models, I think it's actually related to the answer to the first part of the question. And that is, we're seeing a lot of these new organizations now looking at fee-based models and subscription-based payments from their customers so that they can actually drive a better and more operationally resilient business model. So the likes of Bunk, one of the Dutch startups offering subscription-based uh, products to their customers. We haven't seen that before. It always used to be free to customers. Uh, Starling and Monzo doing the same in the UK. Okay. So I think that's a very, uh, that's a very short answer to a very good question. Uh, thank you so much, Owen. Very helpful. Thanks for anchoring the end of this great second day. That concludes our content for the day. I hope everybody enjoyed the sessions again. The winner of today's poll is from Oral Sorobatre from TCS. Congrats, Saurabh. You must be a really good golfer to know what an albatross is. I've never heard of that because I'm not that good. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow. We're going to talk about uh, energy sector, consumer services sector, artificial intelligence, uh, closing keynote from Lois Coatney on keeping client relationships. Our day begins same time, 11 a.m. Eastern. See you tomorrow. Thanks, Owen. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of your day.